Hey everybody. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thanks to the Library of Virginia, Library of Virginia Foundation, everybody who's involved in having me here tonight. Um, my plan is to toggle a bit between doing some readings from the book and then showing you some images and talking more informally about my life in Roanoke um, and the journey of discovering queer history in Roanoke and um, some of the big ideas of the book. And hopefully it gets you to a point tonight um, where you can leave and think about your own communities, think about Richmond, think about the communities you live in and what it would look like to, um, to really do queer history in these spaces that we live in and call home. All right, so I'm going to begin with a story. I did not pack the right clothes for a funeral. I emptied my luggage onto the floor, spilling out colorful dresses and skirts, blouses and flats, makeup and jewelry, all evidence of a nascent trans life. That summer was supposed to be the beginning of my becoming, a fork in the road on my gender journey. Just one month earlier at a Christian summer camp in Southwest Virginia, transformed if momentarily into a queer oasis, I told my friends that I'd like them to refer to me as they. More specifically for an entire week in the Appalachian Mountains, I wore a clunky construction paper name tag around my neck loosely held by a single thread of colorful yarn and it read Gregory, they, them. By midsummer, I was then living in a cramped sublet in Brooklyn, my summer writing cave. I threw an outfit together and hustled out the door. From Flatbush, I, I moved along a seemingly endless series of subway lines to a small Jewish funeral home on a busy street corner in Forest Hills. I had settled on a simple black blouse, a thin necklace, red denim skinny jeans, and black ballet flats. It was the best I could muster from the limitations of my femme wardrobe. I had not brought any of my old boy clothes with me. And there I came face to face with my biological parents and my aunt and my uncle, the Jewish diaspora, all reunited in one room. Three years earlier, I had first tried coming out to my parents at the not so tender age of 31. I remember they reacted with worry and concern to my coming out story. My father sent an email in response, warning that in sharing such personal information about my gender and sexuality with the world, I was potentially affecting my prospect of attaining academic employment. Well, and I just got tenure last year, so. <laughs> <laughs> my, mother, my mother wrote a longer, more personal letter. She slipped it inside an envelope and handed it to me during a rare, ill-fated visit home with my first queer girlfriend. From the funeral home, we carpooled next to a small cemetery a mile away, where we bade farewell to my mother's sister's husband's mother. She had lived to be 100 years old. I watched her body descend into a cavern alongside other deceased members of her kin. Among them was a person whose gravestone was marked with the name Alan. My mother's letter had introduced me to Alan. He was her sister's husband's brother. My mom said that Alan, like me, had been in a heterosexual marriage, and his marriage, like mine, had fallen apart. He had subsequently come out as gay. Alan paid the ultimate price for those actions, she explained. He contracted HIV and died in 1989. One of this country's hundreds of thousands of people who have died from HIV and AIDS. My mom suggested that I too would face great peril if I lived a queer life. 
I hadn't known any of this about Alan. I didn't even know that he had lived. Her words hurt me so much that I hid that letter or I destroyed it, and I can't remember which, and to this day I cannot find it. In the heat of midsummer, with the sun beating down upon us, I could not stop staring at Alan's grave. I wondered what it meant, if anything, for me to be standing right there in front of him in my blouse and ballet flats and jewelry. Would he have recognized something of himself in me? Would I have seen something of myself in him? I was six when he died. No one ever spoke of him or about any of our family's long history of queerness until I was 31 until I forced that information out of my parents through the trauma of my own coming out journey and their reaction to it. My parents seemingly remembered Alan's life only as a cautionary tale, only relevant in this moment because their son threatened to replicate his perceived mistakes. My coming out process reconnected my mother with this history of queer trauma from her own past. There was so much mystery surrounding my family's queerness, but why? At the conclusion of the funeral, my mom walked up to Alan's grave and placed a small pebble on top of the blue gray stone bearing his name. In Jewish custom, this is a common ritual performed to remember those who have passed. She was remembering a friend, her sister's husband's brother, and remembering the ways in which the AIDS crisis and American LGBTQ history broadly touched our family and changed our lives. It would continue to change our lives. This is me at my first Pride Parade when I was 32. I'm 39 now. Um, Coming out for me was a, a, a fluid and nonlinear process of, um, you see, I still have a be big beard and um, I still identified as a man at that time. I came out as queer, as a queer man first, um, which I think is what prompted my mom to think that I was gonna get AIDS, which I had to explain um, to her how hurtful and you know, um, that that was. But the reality is that, you know, as I mentioned in that passage too, I, my, my first queer relationship was with a woman, was with a lesbian, uh, although I looked like that. And, um, you know, so it was kind of a weird moment for me of when of first coming out of knowing that, um, well, when I came out, I wrote this thing that I posted online, which is what my parents got so upset about. And I said, I'm not 100% straight, I'm not 100% male. And I was working on the like, not 100% straight part first. And then it was later on that I realized that um, I needed to work on that 100%, not 100% male part too. But when I came out, this is in Boston, the Boston Pride Parade. It was the summer before I moved to Virginia. I, Lived, I was from New York and was living in New York for a long time. And as I say in the intro to the book, I had never lived south of the Verrazano Bridge. <laughs> so that, that was my sense of the south. <laughs> New Jersey. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I got a fellowship in Boston that summer before, when I'd already accepted a job at Roanoke College and I knew I was moving to Southwest Virginia. Um, and that was when I went to my first Pride Parade. And I went on a walking tour in Boston led by a group called The History Project. It's one of the oldest LGBTQ community history endeavors in this country. They were founded um, in the late 1970s. And that summer during, during Pride Month, they offered a tour that recreated the 1970 Pride March in Boston. So the walking tour took us from where the march started to all of the sites where they demonstrated and uh, to, to the end. Um, one, a reminder that you know, early pride parades were not 
celebratory parades. They were marches of defiance. Um, but also what it showed me was that doing community-based queer history was possible and it was fun. Um, I met a lot of cool and cute people um, on that tour. And it gave me some ideas for when I would move to Roanoke about how I might use my skills as a historian, which sadly is just like, that's the only, one of the only skills I have to offer. You know, I'm not skilled in um, a lot of other trades. Um, but to show up in this new community with my PhD in history, which I just received, and how could I use that as a vehicle for meeting queer people and doing the work on myself of finding out who I was. So this is the first Pride Parade that I went to in Roanoke a couple months later. So Roanoke has long held its Pride um, celebration in September. The reason of that was to avoid uh, conflict with other ones nearby. Everybody in Roanoke wanted to go to DC for DC Pride and go to other places. So they started doing it in September. But this is September 2015, so it's my second month in Virginia and uh, just a view of, of marchers um, at the Pride Parade. That same month of this Pride Parade, we had the first meeting of what would become the Southwest Virginia LGBTQ plus history project, um, which is the endeavor profiled in this book. It's a loose and ever-changing coalition of queer people um, who are interested in queer history, most of them who do not have degrees in history, um, just LGBTQ people of all ages who want to know more about the past. So we started meeting in the fall of 2015 um, with ideas about, you know, what can we do to learn about this community? Um, what stories can we capture and tell? And um, what do people want to know? You know, just asking those questions. So before I move on and show you some of the things we discovered, I want to introduce you all to Roanoke. How many of you have been to Roanoke, Virginia? Okay, lovely, my home. Um, so I want to read you just a little bit about when I introduced Roanoke as a city um, in the book to give you a sense of how I move through space in Roanoke and what I think of it. Walk around downtown Roanoke on a Saturday evening in the summertime and feast your senses on this heteronormative tableau. <laughs> white white middle-class men and women stroll up and down Market Street. Downtown bars brim with homogenized bros. <laughs> the dark, dank interiors smelling vaguely of craft brew and old spice. <laughs> Former sorority girls spill out onto the sidewalk in front of Sidewinders and Corned Beef and Company. LGBTQ people are here too, if perhaps less conspicuously. Roanoke is a diverse city. Indeed, we are told that that is among the charms of downtown. But I find it hard to navigate these streets. I don't feel like I'm blending in at all. People are staring at my face or at my long legs, and some train their eyes for just a bit too long. Something about the overall tableau is predictable. Is this really Roanoke, or is it Asheville, or Greenville, or some other small gentrifying Appalachian city? We're told that this is what we should want, the progressive profitability of sameness, the calming illusion of safety, the superficial facade of historicity. Civic boosters say that Roanoke's experiencing an urban renaissance. They are excited about our small city becoming the next Asheville. But what does that really mean? More hipsters, more beer, rising rents? The counterpoint to Roanoke's ascendance is and has always been the persistence of so-called undesirable people including LGBTQ people like myself, who do not conform to heteronormative capitalist expectations for appropriate urban behavior. 
And in contrast to the moralism of Jerry Falwell's Lynchburg an hour to our east, or the small Appalachian coal towns dotting the mountains to our west, Roanoke is and has always been Southwest Virginia's Sin City. <laughs> Roanoke is odd, permissive, and teeming with debauchery. It is a sexual city. It is a fundamentally queer place. Roanoke is a hub that has attracted queer and trans people from the surrounding region for over half a century. I feel these histories within me as I navigate the downtown streets. LGBTQ histories reside hidden to most observers on street corners and in alleyways, invisible behind the city's heteronormative facade. I want people to know that this place was queer, or still is, or can be. It does not have to be so clean and so charming. I wish Roanoke was just a little bit more queer. But Roanoke's LGBTQ histories are submerged underneath a century of denial and at times outright efforts by the city to erase and make memoryless our former spaces of belonging. So when a group of my students from Roanoke College ventured downtown in early 2017, digital audio recorder in hand, to interview one of the most famous trans sex workers in Roanoke's history, the first thing this person let loose on them was a genealogy of queer belonging that placed her life in the larger story of Roanoke, Virginia, at the tail end of a 200 year history, belying the common assumption that LGBTQ people here have no past. She spoke of, quote, her great grandfather, who was the son of a plantation owner and a slave, and her grandmother, the product of a slave and a plantation owner. She stated, quote, I'm very proud of my great grandparents who came out of the slave era, end quote. She told the story of her grandparents, the first in her family to attend college, and then her parents, and then her childhood, saying, quote, I started singing in the church when I was four years old, end quote. All of this came tumbling out of her mouth in just the first two minutes. We're not supposed to know this story. Christy, which is the name we're using for her, an African-American former transvestite sex worker was arrested dozens of times in the 1980s and 90s. She is perhaps an unlikely community historian, but in a remarkable oral history, Christie recites not just a genealogy of her own existence, but the story of black people with roots in Southern soil, a story that takes the listener on a journey from slavery to the present day linking racism and the criminal justice system with LGBTQ rights and transgender community formation. Christie shows us that it's possible to queer the history of Roanoke, Virginia. There are people, places, and memories that remain here, and with careful attention, we can bring them back to life. This, uh, this is Christy in boy clothes. Um, this is Christy on the courthouse steps. Uh, these steps are still there um, around the corner of Third Street and Church Avenue, downtown Roanoke. Very close to the former Robert E. Lee monument that was ripped down a couple of years ago. Um, this is a photograph from the Roanoke Times from 1993. We've blocked out her dead name, her birth name there, yeah, so you, you don't need to know that. Um, judge asked to toss out anti-soliciting ordinance. So um, in this year, 1993, or I guess in the year, pre the year previous, 1992, Christie had been arrested 16 times that year on charges related to prostitution. And she got fed up with it and she decided to challenge the city's anti-solicitation ordinance, the law that they use to crack down on sex workers. 
the court would have appointed her a lawyer, but she dismissed that person, decided to represent herself. You see her carrying a briefcase. It's pretty amazing story, and it's in my book, of, of, of her going to court, representing herself you know, as a black transvestite sex worker. Um, the judge sometimes referred to her uh, as sir, sometimes as ma'am. Sometimes she showed up in women's clothes. Sometimes she showed up in men's clothes. Um, the judge was frustrated with that. And um, the judge at one time remarks how astounded uh, he was at Christie's knowledge of the law. She's quoting you know, specific statutes and stuff like this. And anyway, um, it's an amazing story because she won. You know, a, a black trans sex worker representing herself against the city of Roanoke. She, over, she won and overturned the city's uh, anti-prostitution law at that time, which was, you know, it was deemed unconstitutional and the city had to go back and figure out a way to, to change their laws. Um, finding Christie's story was an interesting process. You know, how do we, how do you, um, how do you get a former trans sex worker to tell their story um, and for a project like this? And what is their motivation to do so? You know, um, well, what happened with Christy? Christy was the first sex worker we interviewed. We have we've ended up uh, since then. We've done we've done oral histories with three. Uh, black trans former sex workers who used to work downtown Roanoke in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Remarkable stories that, um, that are in my book. With Christie's case, I think what happened, if I recall, is that one of my students and I were in the Virginia Room, uh, which is a local archive in Roanoke at the Roanoke Public Library. And we were just calling up random folders that they have in filing cabinets um, behind the desk at the Virginia Room you know, call up a folder about a particular neighborhood and see if there was anything in there about queer people. That's kind of the way we, we've been searching through the archives. And um, there was this little folder called prostitution. Thing. And we're going through it, and it's all about cis women, cisgender women, um, which is great. And, you know, we took notes on that, but that, that much of that didn't end up in the book. But then we, we found this, this photo. We're like, who is this person? And... Um, and then we found more and more references to Christy over a span of like five years in the Roanoke Times. Um, the one benefit of having her birth name was that uh, we were able to use that to track her down online and thoughtfully reach out and ask if she wanted to tell her story. And she was very enthusiastic uh, about it, as you heard from some of the quotes I shared. So she became our, our first interview with a trans sex worker and. Um, that ended up becoming a big part of our project. What else did we find? Um, this is the first. This is the first issue of the first ever gay publication published in Southwest Virginia that we know of, the Big Lick Gazette. And you know, we benefit in Roanoke from the fact that before Roanoke was a city, um, it was a it was a town before 1882 called Big Lick. And so, for gay people, that's just wonderful. <laughs> The innuendo is just served on a platter. So um, you can see, published by the Gay Alliance of Roanoke, uh, they later changed their name to the Gay Alliance of the Roanoke Valley because people in Vinton, which is a little small um, city next to Roanoke, got really upset. Gay people in Vinton who were like, what about us? So um, eventually they were GARV, the Gay Alliance of the Roanoke Valley. This is the first issue. It's volume one, number one, September 1971. So this is just a little over two years after the Stonewall uprising in New York City in June of 69. How did we find this? Um, so when we started this project, that very first meeting of the project, we had 18 people show up at the Roanoke Diversity Center, which is an LGBT community center. In Roanoke, it was actually founded just two years before I moved to Roanoke in 2013. And we had this initial history meeting at the diversity center, just like queer history, come on out, like meet this weird professor who showed up in town and like, let's talk about what we can do. And out of that first meeting um, where we had big pieces of paper and markers and I was asking the queer people in the room to just brainstorm about what they wanted to know. 
they came up with um, two mandates. One was to create an archive of queer historical materials where none had existed. And the other was to do the oral history interviews, which we've, we're still doing. At the very first um, archive collection event um, that we held, which was at the Diversity Center, uh, at the LGBTQ Community Center, and I believe we just advertised word of mouth and maybe on Facebook, um, we got a couple donors, the first donors, including um, this guy, Jerry, who's in the book. And uh, he's an older white gay man. And he brought this. Uh, he, brought, he brought like a little manila envelope with mostly newsletters from the 1970s, which is actually when he was a teenager. Um, he was not involved in those groups. He was not involved to the 80s um, in gay activist groups in Roanoke which tells me that, you know, he's a historian too, right? He, he was collecting these materials even though this was not his group that he was involved in. But he had been holding on to this for presumably 40 years, 30, 40 years, and um, trusted us to hand it over for a new archive that we were creating. And so we were able to digitize it. And all of the issues of the Big Lick Gazette and the Virginia Gazette, which followed it, um, from the 70s are all online, full PDFs now that you can you know, go to our website and download and read these. Um, so this was a pretty amazing find. Um, we learned a lot from these early newsletters. Um, they talk about early protest actions, the first queer protests we know of in 1971 in Roanoke, which went spectacularly poorly. <laughs> um, <laughs> Roanoke was not super agitated about gay liberation. Um, but this small core group of people were, and we've been able to do an oral history with one member of this group too. Uh, you know, this group only existed for a year. And so now that's exactly 50 years ago, 50, 20 years ago. So we have interviewed an older gay man who was one of the founders. Talk about oral histories. This is uh, not an oral history picture. It's a picture from a public radio program that we were involved with. My friend Cass is, uh, who used to work for, um, with good reason, the Virginia Public Humanities uh, Public Radio Show. This was for an episode they did uh, about Queer Roanoke. And this is at the Mill Mountain Coffee Shop in downtown Roanoke, where Cass is interviewing two older black gay men about their memories of Roanoke in the 1970s. Um, and if you, if you Google, if you go to our website, or if you Google like um, Queer Roanoke with good reason, um, or Queer Rona Public Radio, you'll, you'll find this story. It's about 10 minutes long. It's got great disco music. And um, it's mostly Don and Peter talking about their memories of that time. Um, we left the coffee house and ended up walking around. This is, I talk about this in the book. We're just kind of circling around the market building in downtown Roanoke on a January snowy day. Um, with Cass's um, microphone on. And so some of what you hear in that radio piece is from us like literally standing in front of buildings where their memories just were coming, flowing through their head. Um, you know, at one point, uh, Peter says like, this door, I remember going through this door into this club, um, just remembering different things that had happened right in those spaces. It's really, really remarkable to walk around with queer elders um, in these spaces that have transformed so much and so much has been erased. And no, no one today who doesn't know the history would, would be able to tell that these were you know, essential queer spaces. Um, but these guys remember it. And it was just really amazing to walk around with them and capture their memories of this street corner, that street corner, this street corner. We also do walking tours. So you know, archives and oral histories are about collecting. Um, but we realized very early on that we, we don't want to just sit on the material. It's important to engage audiences with it. So we created walking tours. Um, this is a picture of my ex um, leading a walking tour in Old Southwest, which is the historic neighborhood or gay neighborhood in Roanoke where I live. Um, you do see um, our first openly gay city council member, Joe Cobb, standing back there with the suit on. He was campaigning for his seat uh, when we took this photo. This is probably 2018. Um, but I love that he was coming on a gay walking tour as part of his campaign <laughs> stop. Um, but 
yeah, anyway, he got, yeah, he got elected. So that was exciting. Um, but yeah, so we do walking tours in three different neighborhoods now. Um, talk about not just gay bars, that's kind of the most common thing people want to know about. But we look at cruising sites where gay men met up for uh, anonymous sexual encounters. There are many of those in downtown Roanoke. Um, a park here, a parking garage over there. Um, we talk about policing and police issues and some sites of major conflict with the police. We talk a lot about sex work in the spaces where trans sex workers worked um, in the conflicts they ran into. Um, in Old Southwest, we look at a lot of these houses. They just look like beautiful old houses. I don't know if any of you have been to that neighborhood. It's a, it's a historic neighborhood. I bought a house in, that na in the neighborhood um, just recently. But for me and for our walking tour guides, knowing the history, it's like every block you can walk and you know that in this apartment building or in this house, um, you know, one of the activist groups, they met there in somebody's apartment. Um, or there's a house in my neighborhood that was an all trans brothel. There's all trans sex workers um, who took care of each other. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, they took care of each other until they didn't. Um, it ended up getting raided um, when one of the girls went to the police and said that she was being exploited by the madam, by the trans madam who was running the show. But um, just to walk by the house and imagine a space carved out by trans people, in, trans, trans sex workers in the early 90s um, to bring Johns back there, a place of safety that they controlled rather than having to go to unsafe places to have sex. Um, I find it really, really inspiring you know, to, um, to know that there are all these spaces littered everywhere. And as you learn the queer history of a place, it's like, I can't go anywhere now in Roanoke without my mind just like rattling off stories about this, this, this. And if I'm in the car on 581 going 60 miles per hour, it goes really fast too. <laughs> so when I have guests come into town, I'm just like, this was this, this was this, this was this, this was this. <laughs> We have a podcast. You can go on Spotify or wherever you get podcasts. Um, most of these have been created by students or college students who use the oral histories to create, to stitch them together, to create um, narratives. The first one we did was the HIV AIDS um, episode right at the start of COVID to help historicize, um, you know, pandemics and Help, help to give queer people some knowledge about what the HIV AIDS crisis looked like locally here. We did the LGBTQ people in the police uh, episode after the uprisings, after George Floyd was killed, as queer people were talking about, you know, what is the role of queer people in this movement, um, in the police abolition movement. So we the big history of the Roanoke Police Department and relationships with the queer community. And then um, one of my students made this Lavender Menace episode, which is about the lesbian feminist movement in Roanoke. We had a badass lesbian group in Roanoke in the 80s. Um, so she talks about that. We have a 3,000 plus volume community library in a uh, gay, gay community library in Roanoke. It's amazing. It, when I moved to Roanoke, people told me it's one of the largest private LGBT libraries on the East Coast. Um, we've been working on that. You helped me a lot with it. <laughs> um, you helped us with it. Cataloging every book to make an online catalog, which we've done. Um, doing programming. We have an LGBTQ book club run out of the library for a couple of years now. Basically, when I moved to Roanoke, this library was all boxed up in a room in a church. And people were like, we want to do something with this. And, you know, in, in, I have a chapter about the internet in my book and wondering, like, what is the role of this? What do we do with this now in an age when you can get all of these books um, online, you can, you can get access to this information anywhere. And a lot of this stuff is really outdated, too. And, you know, particularly for, for young readers, I think some of these titles, we look at them and we're like, oh, this is cringy. Um, so, you know, we've grappled with what, are, what is our responsibility with this kind of queer history? 
a community library that was created in the 90s, the late 90s, um, by a group of gay men and lesbians at a time when the Roanoke Public Library would not carry LGBTQ books, uh, at a time when we had a gay bookstore in Roanoke because you could not get these titles at non-gay bookstores. And um, it began with a thousand volumes from one particular um, one gentleman. And when he died, uh, it was in his will that it should become a community library. So we're trying to do that. We're trying to keep this library going. Right now it's housed inside the diversity center, the community center in Roanoke. Oh, this is the With Good Reason um, public radio show. You want to check that out. All right. I think I have an another passage I'm going to share. Well, I think I might skip that one for time, so we have time for Q&A. I have some questions for y'all about, for you to think about what does it look like to do this work in your community? Maybe I'll read, I'll read just a little, little bit um, from this section to give you a sense of what I mean by living queer history. I believe that queer history is a living practice and it lives on in spaces of remembrance and belonging. When I walk Roanoke's paved streets and dirt alleyways today, I encounter the remnants, some might even say the queer ghosts, of an almost forgotten past. The work of queer public history is to make and remake these spaces of queer historical consciousness, to foster a renewed sense of togetherness and belonging around a shared understanding of the past. Our engagement with local histories op opens up new worlds of possibility for our collective future, for who we might become and how we might live together in the city as queer and trans people. So you might think about in your communities, many of you might be from Richmond, you know, what, where is queer history to be found here? In fact, there's a long history of some, amaz some amazing activists doing queer history work here in Richmond. So big shout out to them who have been doing that work. Where can we find it? What stories are hidden? Why are they hidden? Um, how might understanding local queer history improve life for LGBTQ people in the present and the future? And I believe that very strongly and that's um, I think one of the theses of my book is that the purpose of this work is really not just to create an exhibit or to create an archive and then say, we've done it. Because um, I, I question, well, what have we done? You know, just to document the past, to put up a plaque and say, queer was here. Um, how does that actually improve the lives of LGBTQ people? I think that's an important question as a historian that I wonder about and that we can all think about, or I urge all LGBTQ people to think about. In the book, I argue that you know, what we should think about queer history as a vehicle for making space today, for making futures possible tomorrow. So what do queer and trans youth need to know to improve life in Southwest Virginia, to make queer life livable for young people who look around and feel like Appalachia is not a place that they can make a life. I know that the stories of queer elders provide a tool for young LGBTQ people where I live to know that people have been here for a long time. Um, to know that they are held by a local trans history, a local queer history. Um, I've also wondered how can queer history be used to um, create spaces of safety for queer people, to create spaces of belonging? How can we use queer history for housing justice for LGBTQ people? How can we use queer history to combat um, dangerous policing? How can we use queer history to make spaces of pleasure um, which have been 
erased from our landscape, all of these spaces of sex that are gone, sexual, the sexual city. So a lot of questions to think about that go beyond the page, right? And I think that that's the power of queer history and why it's living is that for me as a queer trans woman today, I need to know that I can live here in Roanoke. I need to know that I belong, that I can make a home, that I will be safe, that I will be held, that I can date, that I can fall in love, that I can have good sex, right? These are important things for queer people today. And I think queer history is an important part of making that world possible. So I'm gonna leave you uh, with a final reading and then we can take questions. This is from the end of my book. And it starts, you, there was that photo of Peter and Don, the two older black gay men. Uh, this story starts in Don's apartment in Old Southwest, a couple blocks from where I live. My friend invites me to attend a holiday party at Don's apartment in Old Southwest. Just a five block walk from my own place on the edge of the neighborhood. I had never been inside Don's home. I'm the first to arrive. He gives me a big hug as I enter. As he prepares food, I look up and around at his apartment walls, decked floor to ceiling with memorabilia from 60 plus years of life and work. Relics of his musical career, the people he met and befriended over the years, vibrant album covers, snapshots of a gay black male life in DC, in New York, and in Roanoke. Hell, Don even has a signed portrait of Christy, once Roanoke's most famous sex worker and now an ordained minister on his wall. If there's a museum of black queer excellence in Roanoke, I'm standing in it. It's not lost on me that at this very moment, the local neighborhood organization is holding their annual holiday parlor tours an event in which Old Southwest homeowners open up their castles for an evening and invite a roving crowd of architecture and design fanatics, or at least those interested in that version of our neighborhood's history, to tour and mingle and spread good holiday cheer. These revelers will not be stopping by Don's apartment, and they're really missing out on his magnificently curated walls, his yummy holiday food, and the multiracial queer community that filters in throughout the evening. There are two Old Southwests tonight. Perhaps there are two Old Southwests every night. As the night winds on and I work my way through Don's famous holiday punch, which was really working its way through me, um, <laughs> friends stop by and I find myself meeting a series of interesting characters, Old Southwest folks I have not yet met. A white straight couple, a black sexually fluid woman, a formerly incarcerated white man. I hear stories of the shenanigans outside of Sunnyside Market, one of the few convenience stores left in our neighborhood, and about Don's famous parties of yesteryear. I think about how just down the street, indeed on this same block, live several well-to-do white cisgender gay men in single family homes. We all know one another and there's no animosity between these gay worlds. Yet Don's Christmas party is a particular kind of gay world, multiracial, multigender, cross-class. This is the old Southwest that I have come to love and the one that I wanna fight for. On Christmas Eve, I attend services at the local Metropolitan Community Church. Roanoke's congregation has existed since 1986 and today is led by an outspoken white lesbian pastor. As the music swirls up into the caverns of the Magisterial Sanctuary, a former Methodist church building in Southeast Roanoke, I look around and I count 20 people, nearly all white and mostly to my eyes, lesbians. Indeed, there are more butches here than I've seen in a long time, reminding me of just how segregated our queer community is. 
Perhaps MCC is Roanoke's last living lesbian space. I don't think so, but there is an air of melancholy on the solemn night. My students this year will work with the pastor to develop plans for LGBTQ senior care at his congregation. I'm grateful for the warm welcome from the butch seated in front of me who turns around and wishes me, a misplaced trans feminine Jew, a very Merry Christmas. <laughs> I feel welcome and safe within these walls. After church, I walk through the neighborhood and through the dark yet peaceful streets to my friend's house. There are four white trans people there, five now, including me. We drink spiked cider and watch bad Christmas movies as the clock ticks from Christmas Eve to Christmas Day. I love these spaces. Don's home, a gay church, an all trans home. I love the ways we continue to organize, how we're able to find one another in this city of 100,000 people. How despite our own segregation, with gay women over here and men over there, trans folks here, cis folks there, black queers here, white people there. There always remains the possibility of not knowing everyone, of yet getting to know them, of learning how to love them and to support them. Of course, there are also spaces that are disappearing. The city is becoming more heteronormative. Downtown is unrecognizable. We face many more years ahead of white supremacy and transphobia in Appalachia. We face the disappearance of older forms of queerness and the emergence of beautiful, vibrant new ways of embodying gender and sexuality. The work of community-based public history is ongoing as we document the queer worlds of yesteryear and plan for the dawn of a new queer world. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Um, if anybody would like to have any questions for Dr. Rosenthal, there's a mic on each side of the room and we'll look for questions um, in the chat online as well. So please just uh, walk up to the mic if you have any questions. Thank you. Hi, um, wonderful talk. I'm just really thinking while you're talking as a person who spent all my life in a classroom, how this history that you're telling is so sadly bumping into this pressure that teachers are feeling in our state, in to me a terrifying way, in what's going on. I have loved ones in Florida who are just looking at what has happened to their state and what their legislature is getting ready to pass with saying that LGBTQ kids um, cannot be seen in a classroom. And how the work that you're doing and how your students especially feel about um, how empowering this all is, and yet also this other reality that we're dealing with as a country right now. Libraries, you, <laughs> this is exactly what you've just been talking about. This material that's so important for kids, um, adults saying, you know, no, this has to go. So I just right. wonder how, it seems so much like what you're doing is um, the other energy to this thing that we're seeing. Right. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think our current governor probably doesn't like my book, you know, if he, if he knew about it. Um, the, the whole concept of the, the divisive concepts, right? That's the language. It's so vague and it's purposefully vague, right? I worry particularly about teachers of color, you know, black teachers, black and brown teachers. I worry about LGBTQ teachers because when I think when the, um, when the boot comes down, if it does, in terms of enforcing this divisive concepts thing in Virginia, I really think it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna particularly harm and target um, teachers who they themselves represent marginalized identities. 
because I've heard I've heard K through twelve teachers who are queer um, or transgender or non-binary, you know, talking about this is true in Florida too with this don't say gay bill, fearing that even just being um, being themselves is itself a divisive concept, right? I think about that. You know, I work at a private college, so this is not that. You know, those executive orders and things don't affect me, but. Every time I walk into the classroom as a trans woman, I think, especially on the first day of class, I think, you know, these students um, might be feeling really challenged by my being. You know, nothing I've said, nothing I've taught them, but just that I'm here. Uh, and in fact, you know, the, the one time I really did face some really bad harassment at the college I work at, this was several, several years ago, early in my transition, was in a gender studies class um, from female students who just were really aggravated that a trans, trans feminine person, trans woman, uh, was teaching them about gender. And, you know, it was interesting and of course disturbing to see, um, to see how I, how I triggered that in them, um, you know, feminist feminist students, um, queer students, who probably didn't even realize how much it was messing them up till I was standing there um, as an authority figure. So yeah, I, I'm very uh, I'm very concerned about all of these bills. Today I was reading up about the new um, this new executive order in Texas that claims that. You know, trans, trans supportive healthcare for minors is child abuse. It's a reinterpretation of of the law that they've put out there. Um, you know that parents, uh, not just doctors, but parents, you know, could be criminally prosecuted for helping their trans kids access uh, puberty blockers and hormones stuff like that. That really, really makes my blood boil. So um, you know, this is clearly part of a culture war. It's it's a strategic political uh, approach to use people like me um, as kind of boogie boogie women. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's very concerning. I do think that, I do hope um, that the work I'm involved in and then working with these students who made it through high school, some of my students, because I get a lot of LGBTQ students who, who come to me and take my classes, from Southwest Virginia, some of them just made it through high school in, a, in an environment of harassment and bullying and misgendering and, and lack of support. And when they get to Roanoke College, I want to you know, take them under my wing and, and give them the tools to go out and fight like hell. Um, and that's what I see my job to be. My question actually feeds right into that. You referenced a time when queer books weren't allowed in Roanoke Public Library. And I wonder, having seen evidence of protest at some libraries around the country about books that have been added, um, has the Roanoke Library had any incidents about specific books that have been added? Um, I don't know of specific incidents. Um, the Roanoke Public Library system today is doing amazing work in terms of diversity and inclusion, uh, in my opinion. They've really come a long way. Um, and so, you know, they are, they are a key partner with us in this work. Um, they house, our, they preserve the oral histories that we create. They house the archives, those newsletters and stuff. They have vowed to care for those things for the next 1,000 years, you know? And our queer community decided on partnering with them. You know, we had a lot of discussions about where do we want our things to go, where they'll be cared for. And there was a lot of faith in the public library system in Roanoke um, as a kind of queer space, as a space that we could trust. Um, so it's been a good partnership. There have been incidents uh, locally in our region uh, the Floyd County Public Library, which is like an hour south of Roanoke, more rural area. They did a drag queen story hour, which you've, you've heard of those events maybe around the country that attracted 
some pretty nasty protests. Um, people who thought that the drag queens were going to convert their kiddos to a queer life. Um, maybe some of them, but that's not the goal. <laughs> you know, so... Um, but but in the run up in the in the city systems they've been amazing so I think it's it's changed a lot I, I haven't seen anything about book banning in any of our local schools you know we've seen that elsewhere in the country um, but it, it's a worrisome trend for sure so um, I've had a lot of conversations in the past with queer elders about the loss of gay bars and just the fact that there's so many few around in comparison to what used to be. And I was wondering, do you find that to be true in Roanoke? And how do you feel about that loss? Yeah, so in 1978, I have this map in the book. I just opened to it, actually. There's a bar map from a gay newsletter published in Roanoke in 1978 that shows five gay bars all within walking distance of each other in downtown Roanoke. When I show this to young queer people in Roanoke today, they're like, five bars all downtown. Um, it's not like that now. We have the park. I don't know how many of you have been to the park, which is our like one gay nightclub that's left in Roanoke. Um, opened in 1978. So I mean, it's amazing historical disco that's still, they're not playing disco, but it's still there. Um, <laughs> but um, these five places listed here, they're all gone. Um, and our bar crawl, which is something I write about in the book, every year we do this event where we we walk from site to site of these former gay bar sites, and we try to get inside the buildings, whatever they are now. Um, some of them are straight bars, and so it has a kind of guerrilla gay bar feel to it. Um, but one is one is a church. Um, we've had interesting encounters there. Um, one of the gay bars is like. Uh, luxury downtown apartments now. So uh, we've been shooed away from some of these sites, but uh, we go to the sites and we read out loud from oral histories from the elders about what happened there. You know, it's about stating that these places matter to us. Um, but you're absolutely right that a trend that we see nationally of the disappearance of gay bars is seen, is seen everywhere locally. Um, what, what does that mean? How do I feel about it? I think it's an interesting question. Um, I'm, as a historian, I'm, I'm most, and as a storyteller, I'm really interested in how the people who used to go there feel about it and just hearing their stories and what are their wants, what are their desires. Um, I don't think there's a lot of desire to bring back some of these old places. And in the book, I talk about how some of these early gay bars and dance clubs in the 70s and 80s uh, were, were riddled with um, bigotry and discrimination. They didn't let trans and gender nonconforming people in. Uh, the first gay bar in Roanoke was all white segregationist, as you would expect in Virginia in the 1950s. Um, so some of the early gay bar history is, is unsettling, actually, to us now in 2022. There's never really been a lesbian bar in Roanoke, not like Babes here, which I love. Um, but like, so, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a history that we can, uh, we need to remember, but um, I think when I talk with elders about it, there's a general feeling of like, let's be careful not to be too romanticizing about it. Um, and I think the question is, yeah, what do queer people in Roanoke need in 2022? And um, a new place just opened up. My, my, friend, um, my friend Toya, who's a black queer woman, she just opened up a new coffee shop downtown. So I'm really excited about it. They're holding spoken word events and stuff there. Really cool vibe. So I think that there are there are queer futures out there, new spaces, you know, rather than, um, you know, maybe rather than returning to the discotheques, the 2020s will see the emergence of new kind of queer and trans spaces that I can't imagine yet. But um, yeah, I hope that is somewhat of an answer for you. Great. 